once again, it's Big Daddy, and uh, here we are with Big Daddy and Friends, and I am so, uh, I'm happy, I'm honored, and uh, our next guest is someone that I know, actually, since I'm in the seventh grade, so we're like, we're going to be aging ourselves, and uh, I could say this proudly and honestly, I used to be his water boy when he was playing football, uh, we both went to the same high school, so uh, anyway, let's get to let's get to the guests. And Pete Koch, welcome to Big Daddy and Friends. How you hey, doing? Hey, good to be with you, Rich, man. Yeah, we go all the way back, all the way back. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, you're right. So we went to a combined junior, senior high. That was grades uh, 7 through 12. And you were playing on a freshman football team. And I'm four years ahead of you and uh, playing on a uh, what turned out to be a Rutgers Cup or a state uh championship team and then just a few years later you worked your way up to the varsity and you were on a, a state championship team too so it's it's good football back then good times yeah you know a lot of people don't realize and uh, you know i had brian i had i had brian baldinger as a, as a guest a couple weeks ago and you know obviously between him and his two brothers you know three brothers at the same time in the nfl and he's also a massive people guy so he understood the importance of you know long island football and he you know He's like, look, I know everything about New High Park and, and you know, vice versa. We knew what Massapequa was. They were obviously a much bigger program, bigger high school. But you know this, and a lot of people back in the day knew this, that we held our own against anybody. And I think in four years of high school, I lost one game. Only one game, which a lot of people can't say. And the other thing, how many people, how many neighborhoods can say, that, you know, you had my family, which produced three football players. And then you had the Garrett family, who Mike Garrett, John Garrett, Steve Garrett, all went on to play college football as well. So for one block to do that, that's a pretty, uh, you know, that's a story in itself. Yeah, we, we were very fortunate, you know, uh, looking back on it. Uh, and what, one quick story is like, we had, we had almost the situation where there was like, two head coaches because yeah. we had uh we had a guy this guy called me mr g he was our was our great leader and head coach but he really he evenly shared the duties with our uh defensive coordinator john Kalo, who spent his uh college career as uh the center for um roger staubach, uh, yeah. roger staubach at the naval academy so uh that's a that's a pretty good pedigree so he brought a lot of that grit and that toughness and that discipline that he had, had had learned about at the Naval Academy and, and instilled that upon us and built a program that uh, I, I believe you told me was uh, had the highest winning percentage in the history of Nassau County. Not yeah. bad. And and you know uh, it was it was uh, the greatest time of my life because I I watched guys like yourself and the Mike Garretts and the Wozniaks and the McCarskies and. The, you know, the names go on and on, how you learn winning, how you learn hard work, and, and, and you learn tradition. I mean, all those things, when the schools used to come to recruit you guys, I used to say, man, I wish that would be me one day, you know, and then boom, here I go, you know, I'm off playing football at the University of Maryland, which I never in my wildest dreams ever thought uh, back then was going to happen. When as later on in life, uh, later on in, you know, 12th grade and, and then I went to Milford Academy, did prep, I realized, wow, I could play this game and I'm playing at a high level, you know, so, you know, off we went. But uh, the one thing that I have to commend you for, and, and I, I, you know, I always want our listeners and viewers to uh, know about the person remember when you went to Cincinnati, uh, you know, as a first round draft pick. And, and I, and I always remember this. I remember walking into the new weight room at our high school and all of a sudden all this hammer strength equipment was there. And I'm like, where did this come from? And everybody's like, well, Pete Koch, Pete Koch got it for us. And I'm like, wow. You know, and I, that was tremendous. I mean, because we were always in the lifting, but we, you know, we had nuts and bolts and whatnot. And then all of a sudden my senior year, we had a official weight room, like, 
and guys loved it. So, you know, I, I, I'll be the first one to say thank you. I'm sure other guys now when they watch this or listen to it will understand, but you know, thank you again. I mean, kudos. I appreciate that. I just felt like uh, at that time in my life, I needed to, to give something back. And it was the, the very humble, like you said, the uh, very humble weight room that we had down in the basement of the high school and the boiler room. We, we shared it with the wrestling team down there. It wasn't much at all and uh but it was uh john Kalo uh who insisted uh and instilled in me that um uh when i was in uh, ninth grade he goes you got everything it takes to be a hell of a football player because you've got you've got and the things that we can't coach you've got you've got height you've got speed you've got quickness you've got instincts and you love the game of football that passion is awesome the one thing you don't have at this time is strength and he was right. I was, I was 6'4 and 162 pounds. And he goes, but we can fix that. It's going to happen in the weight room, right? So that's separate from what happens on the football field, and that's the weight room. So I put my arms around that and started reading all the bodybuilding magazines and bought myself some Hoffman's uh, protein, <laughs> that terrible tasting stuff. And uh, it went pretty well for me. So then, you know, you take the next step and you leave New High Park and go to the University of Maryland. And... Uh, you know, for me, it's like, uh, I was like, when I knew I was going there, I'm like, wow, I'm following Pete Koch and Rich Wozniak and Bob Abellini. Cause you know, Bob obviously, you know, went to our school and played there and he had a successful career as a quarterback with the bears and whatnot. Um, so you're at Maryland. Um, uh, you, you know, I know you played alongside Garnish Brown, you know, rest in peace. And, and several other guys that I know who played around that uh, era, you you got there where Claiborne was there, correct? And then, yes. Bobby Ro- and then Bobby Ross came in and revamped everything and turned it all around. Yeah. I spent two years with each. So Jerry Claiborne, who, uh, for those that remember that, the sort of uh, college football historians, uh, he was a head coach of Maryland for a long time. He, he eventually left to join his alumni uh, and become the head coach at the University of Kentucky. He wanted to, wanted to finish that way, couldn't blame him for that, but he, but he really learned how to coach, um, Jerry Claiborne did, uh, from Bear Bryant. So uh, he played for Bear Bryant, and then he uh, joined his staff and, and, and came off the, the Bear Bryant coaching tree. So uh, the, those uh, Southern Baptist uh, 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 principles and, and, and values were instilled in us as, as a football team and a lot of things that would be uh, considered uh, politically incorrect uh, in today's day and age, including uh, nobody on the team was uh, allowed to have uh, hair that was, that was longer than the, than the bottom of their ear and nobody was allowed to have facial hair. All right. And, and that sounds like it must've been 200 years ago, but that yeah. was, that, that was 1980. That was 80 and 81. And, um, and when he left, and went to Kentucky, we, it was really a blessing in, dis- in disguise because uh, of, the, of the guy that, that, that was hired to take his spot, and that's Bobby Ross, who had been for some years a, the special teams and running backs coach with the Kansas City Chiefs under the, the uh, head coach of uh, Marv Levy. And uh, Bobby Ross was, was very, very uh, prepared to take over as, uh, and, and lead Maryland. That was his first head coaching job believe and um and he brought the, a pro style offense i wish he would have brought a pro style defense a little bit sooner than he did yeah. uh because we were playing an antiquated defense but um uh, but he was um i gotta believe that uh the, the the greatest benefactors for was everybody that lined up on the offensive side of the ball particularly at the skill positions because of the offense that he ran which was a pro style offense and he brought that right to the the acc and boomer Esaias and Meet and then after him, Frank Reich uh, immediately uh, began to dominate. I guess it was Neil O'Donnell was was next, or Stan Gelbaugh, Neil O'Donnell. It was Stan Gelbaugh, Stan Gelbaugh, then Dan Henning Jr. Okay, then there Neil. you go. Yeah, then Neil. Yeah. Yep. So Godzilla. not sure about Dan, but uh, every single one of those guys uh, went on and play had had long NFL careers. Yeah, and and I think they could uh, place the uh, the credit squarely on the common denominator there which was which was bobby ross was up coaching quarterbacks as good as anybody in the nation at that time so then you take your game the first round the cincinnati Bengals, and i remember watching that draft and 
you know, cheering for you and being very happy and, you know, obviously being a, a New High Parker and then a Maryland guy. So, uh, you know, you, uh, you go there and then you, uh, then you went from there to Kansas City or to Oakland? Uh, Kansas City. Kansas yeah. City. Okay. For uh, one season, once one one uh, rocky season uh, in uh, in Cincinnati, and then uh, on to the Kansas City Chiefs, where I, I really found my footing and I found my my uh, my health because uh, I was just banged up the whole time I was in Cincinnati on top of everything else. And then I I found a home in in in, in Kansas City, found my way in my second year to the, into the starting lineup. And um, we, we made a run, made it to the playoffs for the first time in, I believe, 16 years. Um, and so I was part of, uh, we were probably the second ranked, I believe we were ranked uh, second or third ranked uh, on total defense, the scoring defense in the NFL. So it was a really strong group of guys that uh, played together as a unit, uh, learned a lot about, that's really where I began to learn uh, football at the highest level. And uh, have, have fond memories of the of the Chiefs organization, and um, very grateful to be a part of that organization for uh, for four years. And then you went to the Raiders after that, right? Yeah. So I had a bunch of I had three orthopedic surgeries in uh, an extended off season, which took me out of the game for almost two years to recover from all that. And by then, I was uh, I was I was like I was I was an unrestricted free agent, and I was approached by a few teams and, and ultimately uh, met with, um, I was, was asked to come and meet uh, Al Davis. I was living in Los Angeles at the time in the off season. And so it was quite convenient, right? So this is the Los Angeles, the Howie Long, Marcus Allen, uh, Los Angeles Raiders. And I drove over to the, uh, the practice facility and the, the offices were all at, at the same place. And I drove over there and I, I met with, uh, with coach uh, Al Davis and, um, we agreed to move forward together. And he said, you know, cause he says, he had said to me, he could, he's very, very candid and he's a football man. As you know, he was, he was the head coach of the Raiders at one point uh, earlier in his career. And he said, um, do you, do you still think you've got, I know you've been through a lot of the surgeries and a lot of stuff and you hadn't played in a while, but, but do you think that you can be, and here's the word that he used, right? So I'm a defensive end. And he said, do you, do you still believe that you could be disruptive? And that's what we're looking for from the defensive line position for people to be disrupt disruptive. And that comes in a number of different forms. I mean, most obviously you sack the quarterback that's being disruptive, but it's batting down passes. It's causing fumbles. It's, it's, it's pushing back against the line of scrimmage. It's penetrating. It's, it's, it's disrupting the path of the running back the ball carrier, even if you don't make the tackle, but if you've been disruptive, it's going to be a, a great benefit. Now what, that's what he was looking for from his defensive lineman. I said, yeah, I believe I, I can still be disruptive in it. And, and I ended up making that team, uh, you know, backing up Howie Long. And that, that felt fine. I mean, at that point in my career, I'd been through so much. I didn't know if I, I, I could, I just could hold together physically and uh, that was that was a perfect spot actually for me to finish, and I was grateful for that time and that that one season with the uh, with the Raiders. Yeah, and I know you know Howie Long very well, and you know I obviously know Howie through doing business with him and you know Fox and all that. And uh, but uh, so now take us to the next step. Now now you leave football and you get into acting. How's that all come about? Yeah, it actually sort of happened at the same time. And um, when it actually, the story gets actually traced back to my high school days on Long Island. And uh, when I was uh, beginning, I, I think my junior year in high school, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to work out at a gym, a real gym, as opposed to the, the not much of a gym that was happening at my uh, New Hyde Park. So let me, uh, let me high take off. Is that when you started going to Rab's? That's right. That's Rab's gym. That gym. <laughs> right. So Rab's gym uh, in Lindbrook, which was a converted um, wall bounds. <laughs> and uh, it was a, it was a combination uh, bodybuilding gym and karate studio. That That's where the name comes from. Uh, R.A.B., which is Richard A. Barathee, who was uh, uh, 
a multi-level um, black belt, and, uh, and he had his own uh, karate style. They called it American Combat Karate, and we'd see him taking the. He was instructing the the, the classes as you know that that was in the back of the gym, and then the bodybuilding was happening in in the front of the gym. So I was a member there. And uh, I met a guy named uh, Perry Ross, and he was about ten years older than me. And uh, we—he became like a like a like a big brother, kind of a friend to me. He he'd uh, he'd come to me play football at Maryland from time to time, and we stayed in touch. And uh, he was he was he owned a small business, but he was also an actor. And he says, "You know what? I got this small business." And he would always tell me, "But I'm going to make it as an actor. I'm studying. I'm doing. I'm doing uh, off Broadway uh, plays." And, he, and it was his passion. And we, we stayed in touch. And then when I went and played for the Cincinnati Bengals, <clears throat> we stayed in touch. I'd come back, you know, obviously to New York, see my, uh, my mother from time to time. And we'd get out. And, um, and then, when I, then I'm, when I was playing with the Kansas City Chiefs, my second year in the league, Perry said to me, why don't, where, what do you need to live? Do you need to live in Kansas City in the offseason? I said, I don't. I, I can live where I want. And for five months, I've got to myself as long as I stay fit and strong. He goes, come on out, hang out with me. And, and he, by the way, he had moved to Los Angeles to pursue his dream. He wanted, he, he made that move. He, he had talked for years about doing it. And then he, he finally did. And so I came, I went to LA and I visited him and Perry says, I think you, I think you could uh, really take advantage of your, your off season it takes you only how long to work out every day. And, 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 and why don't you, if you're interested, um, think about becoming an actor and learning the business and I'd be glad to help you. And he did. And I found an agent and I found an acting school. I found a commercial acting workshop, which is how most actors started. And I learned to be, be, began to learn what I was doing. And, um, and I started to have some success and that began a process where I would go to Kansas City, play football, and be there about six and a half months, and then come back to LA and uh, hang out with my buddy Perry. You know, we worked out together. He was a personal trainer, all right, when he wasn't acting, and and uh, and that began that began uh, me making television, uh, television episodic television, uh, booking roles in feature films, and uh, shooting commercials in the in the off season, and uh, off I went. So Nash Bridges, Silk Stockings, was all that first before you got into the movies or were the movies first and then vice versa? It's a good question. Yeah, I have to, you're testing my, <laughs> my memory a little bit. I, I, well, believe, I did uh, my homework, you know, so. Yeah, I, right. So I, my last year in the league uh, was 89 and uh, I had uh, accomplished a number of films and TV shows. I was, I was uh, of course, a working a uh, member of the Screen Actors Guild. And, um, and then, but if memory serves me, uh, I shot um, Silk Stockings, I believe it was in the early 90s. I want to say it was around 93. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a little, at, I think a little while after that uh, was um, Nash Bridges, which was Don Johnson and Cheech Martin and uh, that show shot up in uh, San Francisco. So flew me up there and I worked on that for a couple of days. Yeah, so, fun. Yeah, and then obviously the whole world knows you as the Swede in Heartbreak Ridge. I mean, that movie is still on every other week. I mean, it's just to, to see, you know, you uh, walk in when you uh, first meet Clint Eastwood I mean, that was so dynamic. It, it's, I'm still amazed to this day. You know, that was an incredible job, and you were in super insane, massive shape, and uh, not your prototypical uh, Marine, but uh, it was great to uh, watch all that and to see it, especially when it first came out. <coughs> yeah, it was... Um... It was, it was thrilling for me. I didn't even, I couldn't even have imagined that this movie would have such a life, you know, all these years later. Uh, th I was cast in that film. I auditioned uh, in a very traditional way uh, and, and cast in that film uh, while I was, during an off season, while I was playing with the Chiefs. And um, it was it was just a, my, 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 my agent had secured me an audition for a, a project uh, that was going to be shot by Warner Brothers, and the audition was on the Warner Brothers uh, studio lot 
And it was very, very secretive and it was very quiet and nobody was saying who the star of the movie was or who the director was, but uh, this was a significant role and in a significant major studio film. And off I went with my, my sides, which is the, the East typically three or four pages of the script, the, the section that where the scene that they would like you to audition with. So I got my head by sides and I learned my lines and I drove over there and uh, I had again, I had I'd never been in a big movie. I had done uh, a couple of commercials and I had, uh, I had one line on an episode of Dallas. <laughs> so <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> so I drove over there, but it's said in the script, Swede enters six feet seven, 280 pounds. And I said, huh, I'm six, six and a half. And, uh, you know, I'm about at the time I'm about, I was about 285 and, uh, maybe a little heavier than that. And, uh, so I felt, I felt like, wow, I, I I'm, I'm pretty uniquely qualified for this. Huh? So I drive over to Warner brothers and it's, you know, be there. It's like a Wednesday afternoon at uh, two 30 and uh, you park the car and then you got to walk about the length of a football field to get over to the building where the audition was being held. And I open up the door and there's a waiting room and there's 40 guys that are my size sitting there. Some a little bit shorter, some a little bigger. You know, there was guys in there, 6'9", 6'10", 300, 320 pounds. Uh, and then... I mean, and then out the door opens up and I said, thank you very much. And then, you know, some guy goes like this walking by and I'm like, I'm just an average guy sitting here. And, uh, huh. That's how, and that was, that was the first audition. And that didn't even count the guys that had already been there and the guys that were going to become coming later in that afternoon, there was probably more than 400 guys. That's, that's, it's just amazing like, to think this, how many there's a lot of big guys in hollywood and they come from all over the world to make it in hollywood well the good news is i got a call back and uh a week later they asked me to come back and just repeat what i had done and i did and they uh this time they filmed it uh the first time they did it was just a casting uh, assistant casting person and this time they filmed it and they said listen so here's what here's what's going to happen the decision is going to be made by the director we still didn't know who was in the movie or directing it and the director's going to look at this this film that we make of you and uh but thank you for coming in and good luck to you so i i, I just did my best that's all you can do and you, you get the call back there was again there was 40 guys you know sitting there and uh and a couple days after that i found out that i got the role so it's a competitive business and uh I was thankful that uh, they were they were interested in what I was what I was doing. I was a young actor. I was very green, but I uh, I got the role. And it turns out obviously that it was Clint Eastwood that was going to look at that film. He personally cast me as he did the rest of the of the movie. And uh, about three weeks later, um, yeah, three weeks later, I started. And so about uh, about so I went uh, uh, and, and had a, a wardrobe fitting. At the on the Warner Brothers lot uh, a week later, and then a, a few days after that, they asked me to come back and shave my head, and then, you know, got all the guys ready to go that way, you know. And um, you start to feel like a marine, you know, when you've got no hair on your head anymore. And uh, and then I drove down to San Diego, which is where we shot it. It was supposed to be Camp Lejeune, but it would we we, uh, we used uh, Camp Pendleton down in San Diego, put us up at a hotel, and I spent the next. Uh, the next five weeks there, and with the exception of one week where we, we uh, they flew us to Puerto Rico, and that was the, the battle scenes towards the end of the movie. That was supposed to be um, uh, Grenada, uh, Battle of uh, Grenada, but that was actually uh, that was actually an island off the coast of Puerto Rico called Vieques, and it's a bit of a resort island. We, we, were, we were there for a week, and then we came back, filmed a little bit more, and I actually had a split a little bit early, but uh, the, the casting people knew that I had to go to training camp. So uh, I, I, I might have worked on a film about another three or four days. They moved a couple scenes around, so I don't think I, I missed anything. But uh, I went directly to uh, uh, Kansas City and from, from there to Liberty, Missouri, where we had our training camp. And I was just back to being a football player until that movie came out. 
I believe it was um, in November that year. So without getting too deep into it, how was it, you know, Clint Eastwood, I mean, legendary actor. I mean, he epitomizes Golden Globe, Oscar, all those awards all yeah. wrapped up in one, you know. Why don't we just say Heisman Trophy, Super Bowl champion, whatever else there is out there. How was it working with him and, and learning the movie game from him? You know, I'll tell you this story, and, I, and I, I've never answered the question that you just asked in quite this way, but, but all your football and, and, and sort of championship metaphors really, just really brought something to the, the forefront of my mind. So I got to San Diego one day before I started filming, which is what the production had asked me to do. And that way I could get to my hotel and get, get comfortable. And then I'd start and I was in a scene uh, the next morning. So I got there uh, uh, and, they, and somebody, somebody from the production said, um, uh, the, they'd like to see you on the set. So I had driven to the, the hotel and somebody picked me up from the production and they drove me onto Camp Pendleton, go through the gates and, had all the proper clearances and everything, and we go, and, it, and they were shooting a scene. And, and they said, you can just hang out right here. And I'm looking about, about 100, 150 feet away from me is, is uh, the guys that would, that you know, uh, Mario Van Peebles and who played Stitch Jones and all those guys that were sort of around me. The, those were my, my bandmates, you know, so to speak, in the film. I hadn't met them yet, but I, I was just watching them do this scene out in the field, and there's who's directing, of course, is, is Clint. So, you know, he's, and he was, and he was in, I think, I'm not sure he was in that scene or not, but, but very often he's, uh, because he's in so many scenes and he's directing the film. So he's in his wardrobe, hair and makeup, and he's directing. It's, there's very few actors in Hollywood that have ever done this, especially nobody's done it so successfully. It's a very difficult thing to do, to direct the movie that you're in. But I'm watching it and I'm like, huh, there he is, 100, 150 feet away from me, there's Clint. And I'm just, you know, watching and a few minutes go by and there's a break, cut, boom, break. And Clint like wheels around, he looks at me like this and he just comes right at me. He start, starts walking right over to me. He says, hey, Pete, man, Clint, good to meet you. I'm, I'm so glad you made it. I'm glad you're working with us on this film. It's gonna be a blast. And it, you talk, it's just, an, it's just a moment of, in my judgment, like leadership, right? Because he's the boss. He's, he's the boss. He's not the star of the film, the director of the film. There's nobody who's a bigger boss, a bigger Don um, in Hollywood than the way that Clint Eastwood goes about his business, right? He's the producer of the show. It's, it's, everybody, all the pressure's on him, the, 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 the people that are, uh, that are running the, the, the budget. All this responsibility is on Clint. And here he comes and just walks straight over to me and welcomes me. But right then, all the anxiety that I had coming, I mean, I was nervous just driving there. I was like, oh my God, am I gonna be able to remember my lines? Am I gonna do this right? What if they fire me? What if they find out I'm a fraud? I don't know what I'm doing. Everything was racing through my mind. But when a person in that position walks over to you and extends their hand and smiles and says, thank you for coming here. Thank you for being part of my, my movie. Um, I, 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 all I could do was melt and, and, and just be the best that I could possibly be. That's what he does. That's what leaders do. They get everybody around them to, to be the best that they can be. And that's the, that's the way, that's the way to approach it. I mean, it was just a great moment for me to learn. And I, all I did was keep my, believe me, I kept my head down. I did my best and I listened to everything that Clint Eastwood said. I observed him as an actor as a director, as a producer, and as a leader. And it was an awesome, awesome uh, experience for me as a young actor and a young man. So, you know, two other movies that uh, you've been in and I enjoyed dearly was uh, Johnny Be Good. And that kind of relates to us growing up and, you know, going through that whole recruiting process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the way they did that movie was, I mean, hilarious, a lot of fun. And then Lover Boy was really, there's the real Pete Koch because you're like this strength and conditioning coach or trainer yeah. and you're chasing around, uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, the, Patrick Dempsey. Patrick Dempsey. 
because he's uh, fooling around with everyone's wives. <laughs> <laughs> and they're ordering pizza so he can come over. I mean, that was like, oh lord, it was it was fun. That had to be fun because there were some big actors in that movie too. And uh, you know, yeah, it must have been well, a lot of fun. I, you know, I, I in in Johnny Be Good, which still is, I think, a, a reasonably funny movie that, that yeah. plays from time to time. And 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 Anthony Michael Hall, who was such a giant star from movies like Sixteen Candles and The Breakfast Club when he was a teenager and here he was just a little, just a little bit older and he was fantastic to work with. He was the star in that movie. And, um, but also Uma Thurman was in that movie and it, it was her very first movie. Wow. Who knew what a, what yeah. a giant star, uh, she would be. And then, um, uh, and, and uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. was in that film. And I remember talking to, to Robert and I just met him briefly. We didn't have a scene together and he was taken off and we were all in the band together. And he said he was gonna go to the airport. He was on, had to go and he was on to his next film. He's going back to LA. I said, what do you got next? And uh, he goes, ah, oh, you know, it's very different. This is like a silly comedy, right? And he goes, my next movie is gonna be very heavy, very heavy. You know, it's just a very personal, very deep story. It's called Less Than Zero. And it's uh, it's a, it's if you've never seen it, I mean, it's, to me, it's quite a brilliant movie. I've read, I've read the book, uh, Brad Easton Ellis, and uh, very heavy, uh, brilliant performance. So anyway, that was a moment in time, and just that was the launch pad for uh, Robert Downey Jr. And then about a year later, I made uh, Lover Boy, which was another comedy and a much better role, and frankly, a, a much better movie. Uh, it's a better script, and. Um, and what's interesting about Loverboy, and lots of folks have seen it because it's such just fun. It plays all the time. And Patrick Dempsey has become one of the biggest stars. And he was very, very uh, generous, very funny, very helpful to all the other actors. And um, uh, Carrie Fisher played my wife, which is <laughs> yeah. really funny, you know, sort of casting. And Kirstie Alley was in that movie. And um, extra and anchovies, extra anchovies, right? extra anchovies, <laughs> and, and Vic Tabak, who was uh, Mel from Mel's Diner, on oh, Alice, God, right? Yeah. On uh, God uh, rest in his soul, he was a wonderful man and a generous actor and a uh, marvelous person. And I had many scenes with Vic Tabak, so uh, I enjoyed that. And uh, that was a very, very, a very fun experience. We shot that all over Los Angeles. And I think what's really notable is uh, uh, is Lover Boy was was directed by a woman. And her name is Joan Micklin Silver, and she directed some other quite good movies. But I don't know that she ever became uh, a well known name outside of the industry. But Joan Micklin Silver had a sensibility because it's no easy task to really find those beats and make things funny, and yeah. she really had that ability. Um, she was ahead of her time, you know, because with, with, with not that many women directing uh, feature films, m more so now than, uh, you know, of just a few years ago. But uh, Joan Micklin Silver, I think, deserves the recognition for uh, helping guys like me um, look pretty funny. It's, 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 it's a good experience. I learned a lot about com comedic acting. So now look at you. You're this tall, lean, good looking guy who's now TV commercials training celebrities i mean it, i mean pete it's it's so commendable and i'm 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 so happy for you and i'm glad that we've uh, stayed in touch all this time and i've seen your progress i i know some of the people that you i won't name but i know some of the people that you work with and you obviously played a joke with one of them on me one morning when you guys buzzed me. And I'm like, wait a minute, I know this voice. And, you know, we know that story. But yeah. uh, tell us about the K Jewelers commercial. You know, I oh. didn't know, I did not know because I guess we hadn't spoken. And then all of a sudden this commercial comes on and I'm like, man, why does that guy look familiar? And I'm like trying <laughs> to piece it, piece it together. Then I get a phone call. Hey, man, did you see Pete Couch on JK? I'm like, whoa, that is him. And then I remember <laughs> I remember watching it going, now he's taking his game to a whole nother level. Look at him. 
Well, that was last Christmas, and and I and so I, for those that are trying to figure out what uh, Rich is talking about, I shot a, a commercial and uh, for K Jewelers. Yeah, I think it's the biggest retail jewelry uh, store in the nation, and uh, it was a very uh, a big budget, a very uh, I thought flashy. I thought it was frankly a beautiful commercial, and I played Santa in that spot. And, uh, and it, you know, what? And, and there was just two characters in this movie and there was no dialogue, but it was a, a 30 second story about uh, Santa finishing his, uh, his evening of delivering toys and then making it home on this absolutely beautiful, uh, massive soundstage uh, at Universal Studios where we shot this. And I come home and I have got a gift for my wife there, Mrs. Claus, who's uh, just about to fall asleep. And that's, that's the spot. It's, it's, it's romantic. And it's, um, I, I think it's, I think it's elegant really. And um, that, uh, that spot, unfortunately didn't run, didn't run again this year, but it's always got a, a place in history for me. And uh, you can just Google, um, uh, 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 K Jewelers commercial with Pete Koch and that'll come up and um, you, you could look at that and I'm, I'm quite proud of the work there and the uh, but again it's all part about the learning experience and the learning curve as an actor uh, I was up against hundreds and hundreds of other uh, uh, actors that quite honestly most every single one of them looked, looked uh, much more uh, traditionally like Santa did guys that had a that had a gut guys that had big beards um, and lots of uh, white hair and character in their faces and an older look and guys were coming to the audition with the little like Santa sunglasses and things. And I was like, I'm not sure I'm in the right spot here. Cause I, I just <laughs> was not, I don't know, but I was, and, but, but, but that's why you can't ever discount what the director is looking for because I was chosen because I, I didn't look like a traditional Santa. They wanted to break the mold and, and, and they called me the contemporary Santa. Uh, why wouldn't he be a little bit more fit? Why wouldn't he yeah, groom exactly. his beard <laughs> a little better? Why couldn't he be physically fit? Yeah. So, um, that was, that was a blessing and that was a, that was a great time. So, uh, yeah, yeah it's fun to play Santa. On that, man, Cause that's, uh, I, I watched it actually the other day again and, uh, oh. and it was, uh, it brought a smile and, uh, and a laugh at the same time. And it, it is a, it's oh, a good. classy commercial. So you should be very proud of yourself for that. And, uh, I thank you. you know, yeah. I worked really nice. hard on that. Thanks. Oh, that's great. So, so what's next for Pete Koch? Let's wrap up. What's next for Pete Koch? Well, one thing that's a constant uh, in my life, and because what isn't a constant is uh, is acting work, you know, as much as it's fun to do and it's challenging and I, and I, I love talking about it. I think I'll always be an actor, but uh, it's been an exceedingly challenging year due to COVID. Production is off by about 90%. I did shoot one commercial this year that uh, I believe is going to start running in January. I shot it in July. Um, and it's for an insurance company. And uh, I, uh, I'm hopeful that, it, that it's, uh, I've got quite a bit of dialogue in this one. So I'm hopeful that it uh, is well received. See, and, uh, and, and hopefully that uh, there'll be more and more uh, production coming out because it's just been a difficult year for, for us in the, uh, in the acting business. What I do otherwise is I help people with their physical fitness through uh, my online training. I do train a handful of people in person, but I'm able to reach more people. Um, um, I, I started doing this thing uh, by releasing short video tapes that um, offered some practical fitness advice called making you better, making you better 30 seconds at a time. And if you follow me on social media, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, um, about once every third time I post, I'll drop a video where I'll, I'll offer just a, a little bit of a practical advice on how you could improve your, your fitness. And uh, the reason I started doing that, because uh, some years ago, I read a quote by uh, Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein, who said, aspire not to be a man of wealth, but rather a man of value. And I thought, well, how can I, I mean, just, I'm a trainer, you know, like, how can I add value to people? And I said, you know what, I've been training people, training myself, 
you know, for 45 years and training other people for, you know, probably 35 years. And I've got a lot of knowledge. So why not share that with people? And it's always free. So uh, that's what I do with my social media. And some people reach out to me from time to time and say, can you help me? Can you help me? And how I help people by designing and uh, educating them on uh, the program design, how they best practices for them, the kind of workouts that they should be doing to achieve their uh, goals. And the same the same uh, philosophy applies to nutrition, because what are the best practices for an individual for them to get the, the, the results that they, that they want? And it's the food part is very, very challenging for a lot of people, but uh, I've got, I've got my arms around that. <laughs> yeah, so I've got my arms around that. I've had some great mentors in my life, uh, Dr. H, the, the, uh, the medical, the Harvard tra trained uh, medical doctor from the biggest loser TV shows is my personal doctor and a, a friend of mine and somebody I work for uh, on occasion when he runs uh, wellness and fat loss programs out of his uh, state in Malibu. So I, I've, I've been around the, the, the healthy weight loss uh, community uh, from a science standpoint, as well as a very practical approach standpoint. And so um, um, I'm, I'm there to help people if they have uh, uh, concerns or would like a partner when it comes to their fitness and, and, and weight loss goals. I see you got your sweet shirt on. Tell everybody, tell oh, yeah. the listeners and viewers how they can get one. Yeah, you can get some gear, right? So there it is. There's a sweet shirt. So I, I over the years, I had so many people say, you know, wouldn't it be awesome, man? Why don't you do like a shirt or something, man, with sweet on it? Because I would definitely buy that. I mean, I, I've got a great following in the military community. I never served, but I played a Marine, you know, that a lot of people have seen and related to, I've gotten just countless, Rich, countless uh, direct messages and emails over the years, some snail mail, real letters over the, over the past 30 years um, where somebody said, I joined the Marine Corps because I saw Swede on the big screen or the small screen, or I've got the DVD and I watch it over and over and it, and it motivated me or animated me to join the military. And um, it just, it's so, I don't, it's overwhelming. If I feel the responsibility of that because you know, there's no hundred uh, percent safety guarantee when you join the military, uh, especially if you're gonna get into combat. So uh, I've always had this special uh, appreciation for those that, that's, that serve our, our great country, uh, for the military. And, uh, and then a few, uh, just last month I decided to release, I, I, I had somebody help me come up with a design. We've got a picture of the Swede, slap it on a shirt. If you go to my, any, find me on social media or my website, petekosh.com, it's easy to find and you can pick yourself up a little bit of swag. Uh, I got a t-shirt, got stuff for the ladies and, um, I'm going to be doing a hat here in the spring, so we'll just we'll mix it up a little bit. But uh, um, yeah, no, I'm, I don't make much money. If you want to make money, don't do T-shirts. Uh, but what I do is I try to keep the prices low, and so that if everybody, you know, it's kind of a novelty item. And if you if you ever uh, if you appreciate the Swede or Clint Eastwood in Heartbreak Ridge, then um, you can get yourself a T-shirt for about twenty five bucks. All right. Well, listen, all you viewers and listeners, get out there and you know. Get your sweet gear and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> support and uh, run around and, you know, do you remember, and I'll, I'll end with this, do you remember that party we went to in San Diego where I ended up uh, taping the part when uh, you walk in to meet Clint Eastwood and you're walking into the party and all of a sudden I put on the speakers on the guy's uh, stereo system, sweet, sweet. Sweet, and everybody's like, "Big Daddy, where'd you get that?" I'm like, "Oh, I taped it off the TV, and uh, I knew, you know, you came down, and uh, that was a that is thing. awesome, yes." And everybody was like, "Oh, how did you do that?" I'm like, "Yeah, nothing. A VCR and a little music can't uh, put together." <laughs> so that was fun. But uh, hey, Pete, um, I want to say thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing uh, a little bit of your history, what you've you, what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're planning on doing, and continued success. And, you know, we're always in touch, and uh, I will be in L.A. at some point when it's safe to be there. Uh, I'll be out there, and we'll link up. And then don't forget, in June, the Big Daddy Celebrity Golf Classic is coming back. So we got to get you back out there hitting the sticks. 
Yeah, and, and every everything right back at you, Rich. I, I appreciate. Make, make no mistake, I, I appreciate your support of me and your friendship of of all these years of forty years, um, more than that, almost fifty years. It's it means a great deal to me. There was a a chunk of time where we kind of missed each other there for about about fifteen or twenty years, and then twenty years ago we reconnected, and it's been my my great pleasure. Uh, to see your great success and all that you do and the charity work that you do. It is absolutely awesome. God bless. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, anything I'm involved with, you're always welcome to be a part of. And uh, I know. And that's thank it, you. man. So another uh, great session here at Big Daddy and Friends. And make sure you uh, check us out. We're on Amazon. We're on Spotify. We're on YouTube. We're on Apple. We're everywhere, man. We're going to take this thing to a whole different platform and, and national audiences and everything you can imagine and everything I could wish for.